My name is Boris Kolmakov. Uh, I'm a founder and, and a software designer at Code Synthesis, um, where we try to solve interesting problems using source code generation. The topic of today's presentation is object relational mapping in C. There are extensive solutions uh, in this area for other programming languages. I'm sure most of you at least heard about Hibernate for Java or Intel Framework and C Sharp. At the same time, uh, until recently, there were no serious implementations or even attempts to provide such implementations in C. I said until recently because uh, about a year and a half ago, I started a project called ODP, but they intend to change that. So I'll uh, introduce ODB and <coughs> then examine how it can be used to get a boost to implement uh, C++ class persistence in, in our applications. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the concept of object relational mapping. But just to recap quickly, the, idea, the basic idea is to be able to save C++ objects in a relational database without having to deal with tables, columns, or SQL. When it comes to ORM, it's usually as important to know what the particular implementation doesn't do as what features it provides. When we started designing ODB, we decided that these nodes are non-negotiable. There's no... <coughs> Uh, manual parameter binding or result set extraction in ODB. Um, I'm sure some of you had the privilege of accessing a relational database using a low level C API can attest that this makes for some really tedious code. There's also no handwritten um, database mapping code in, in, in ODB. Um, other ORM implementations out there for C++ require you to write some code or call some macro for each persistent class as well as for each data member in, in the persistent class. Finally, ODB is not a framework. It doesn't dictate how you should write your application. Instead, it's designed to fit into your style and architecture by only handling C++ object persistence and not interfering with any other functionality. In particular, uh, as, as we will see in a moment, there is no special base class from which all persistent classes should inherit, nor are you forced to use any special containers or smart pointers. This, this is actually very similar to, to the to ASIO idea that you know, we don't dictate how things should be done. So, we've seen what, what ODB doesn't do. Let's see now what it can do for you. ODB will automatically generate a database conversion code from your C++ class declarations. No, we didn't implement our own C++ compiler, and there's no magic here either. Underneath, ODB is, is, is implemented as a GCC plugin. As a result, it can handle pretty much any standard C++. Uh, ODB also provides uh, object-oriented, object multi-threaded database API with encapsulated connection management. Uh, then there is the statically typed uh, C++ integrated query language. Another uh, important feature is database portability. Because uh, the database conversion code is automatically generated by the ODB compiler, and because the user code is, is written using a common database API rather than a specific database interface. Um, it, all this makes it fairly easy to switch from one database vendor to another. Finally, ODB is, is, is very flexible and customizable. It can either completely hide the relational nature of the underlying database or expose some of the details as required. At an extreme, it can be used as just a convenient way to extract data from query results. Um, let me just uh, give a one-slide introduction to the GCC plugins uh, that, I, that I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, for those of you who haven't attended my previous talk, um, 
in the version 4.5, which was released in April 2002, GCC added support for compiler plugins. Um, a pl the plugin architecture allows us to, it, it uses dynamic loading and it allows us to hook into the compilation pipeline pretty much anywhere starting from the compiler startup and ending with assembler output. Uh, one interesting application of plugins is to reuse the mature C++ parser, which is part of, part of GCC. This is essentially what ODB does. Now, some of you might think that uh, because ODB is, is based on GCC or uses GCC, uh, that its use is limited only to this compiler. Uh, this is not the case. Um, all ODB uh, well, ODB is written in standard C++ and all the generated code that is produced by the ODB compiler is also standard C++. As a result, any, any modern uh, C++ compiler can be used to compile the runtime libraries and the generated code. Uh, for example, we test every uh, release of ODB on the listed platforms and with the listed C++ compilers. We also provide uh, pre-built ODB compiler binaries with a private copy of GCC for all these platforms. So I just want to repeat this uh, point because there's usually a lot of confusion. ODB compiler basically takes C++ as input and C++ as, and produces C++ as output. So the, the output of the, C, of the ODB compiler is actually compiled by the C++ compiler that you are using for your application. Okay, what about um, supported databases? ODB is designed to be cross-database. It's not tied to this particular database implementation. Um, currently, we support MySQL and SQLite. Uh, Postgres, Oracle, and Microsoft SQL Server are in the pipeline. Um, in particular, the next release will add support for Postgres. Uh, no talk about C++ library or tool will be complete without mentioning its performance. ODB was designed with high performance in mind from the grounds up. It uses prepaid statements throughout. Uh, it caches connections, statements, and even memory buffers. Uh, to access um, the underlying database we use native C APIs instead of um, wrappers such as ODBC. Um, this allows us to minimize over here and also gain access to all the functionality provided by the database. <coughs> Finally, uh, ODB imposes uh, zero per object memory over here. Here are some uh, indicative <coughs> performance numbers for loading an object with a a uh, couple of dozen members. Um, Boris? Yes. Um, my, my concern when, when talking about anything having to do with persistence is uh, my, the hardest problem always seems to be schema evolution. Have you I, addressed I'm that? I'm going to talk about that okay. later. <coughs> but yeah, that's, that's, that's a big problem. And, and that, that's what we were using your XML library for, incidentally. Um, yeah, just just to know that, well, some some people has the, have a notion of a relational database as as some you know expensive legacy thing running on the big iron somewhere, but and very slow uh, as a result. Mm. But here is an example of a SQL Lite database, which is actually an embedded database. It's part of your application. Which, which I think is, is, is very fast for a relational database. And this is for an on-disk database that you can also have an in-memory database, which would be even faster. I guess those no the importance of those numbers sort of depends on the complexity of the objects you're storing right. there, right? Yeah, that's why I said it's indicative performance. Yeah. Generally, when it comes to performance of, of, of mirroring performance of a, data, of a relational database. Pretty much any benchmark is useless. You need to write your a, a scenario that kind of mimics what you are doing in your application. And, do that. and incidentally, it, it's, it's actually very easy to do with ODB because 
the, the tedious part is handled for you, so you can rip out a benchmark and half and half pretty much. That's what I did for, for these numbers. Okay, let me also mention the license. Um, ODB is dual licensed under the GPL and a commercial license. Um, those of you who are familiar with uh, MySQL or Berkeley DB, uh, this is essentially the same licensing scheme. In particular, if you are using ODB-based application only within your organization, for example, by running it on your company's servers, then you, you don't really need to worry about any of the GPL restrictions. You don't need to publish your source code or anything like that. Okay, so preliminaries out of the way. Um, let's dive into our first example. Um, we would like to create a, a bar tracker, a uh, boost needs map needs one and hopefully we'll have something ready by the end of the presentation. <laughs> uh, the first version of our bug report has just four, four members. Uh, the bug ID, uh, its status which can be open, confirmed or closed. Then we have a, a summary and, and a full description of the bug. Let's see what it takes to convert this uh, ordinary C++ class to an ODB <coughs> persistent class. So here are the modifications. First thing that we have to do is add the uh, object pragma. Uh, the, this pragma tells the ODB compiler that this class is persistent and that some database conversion code should be generated for it. The next line is the friend declaration. All our data members are private and this declaration allows the ODB generated code to access them. The next change is the is the default constructor. Well, this is not strictly necessary. It makes working with persistent objects much easier. Um, we can make it private, as as I did here. If you don't want to expose this constructor to the, to the users of your class. The last change. Um, finally, we mark the the bug ID as an automatically assigned uh, object identifier. Each persistent class in ODB must have uh, an object. Here are all the changes highlighted again. Okay. Any questions? Let's now see um, how the build workflow of our application changes once we introduce a new into the picture. Here's a, a typical uh, C application consisting of, of a header file and a source file. The source file includes the header file and is compiled with a C. Compiler to, to create an executable. Once we start using ODB, the header file is compiled with the ODB compiler. The output of the ODB compiler is a set of um, C source and header files. Uh, we can also ask ODB compiler to generate the database schema for our persistent classes. The application source code includes the generated header file in order to gain access to the database uh, conversion code. Finally, the generated source code is compiled along with the application source by the C++ compiler to, to create an executable. Any questions here? Uh, here are some examples uh, of invoking the ODB compiler. Here I assume that we saved our bug class to the bug here. <coughs> As I mentioned earlier, ODB is, a, is a, real, well, a real C++ compiler in the sense that we can use uh, common options such as dash i, as shown in the second line. Um, here we also request the generation of the database schema. Here's how it what it looks like uh, if you are using the MySQL database, just to give you a sense of what's going on. Mm -hmm. okay. So we have um, we have a persistent class declaration. We also generated uh, the database conversion code for it. What else do we need in order to be able to persist the, this class? The last thing that we need is to create the database instance. This code fragment shows how we can do that for the MySQL data. 
is the same code for SQL Lite. Notice the different types used in the, in the pointer and in the new expressions. ODB database is a, is a common uh, database interface, while ODB MySQL database <coughs> and ODB SQL Lite database are specific implementations of this interface. This is generally the only place where we will mention the specific database that we are using. Uh, the rest of the code works through the common uh, ODB database interface. This is one of the features why we can switch from, from one vendor to another fairly easy. Yes? Uh, I'm just wondering, is it part of the ordinary paradigm that you, you have to dynamically allocate this thing? Because it seems like you could just find the, a reference, for example. Right. No, you yeah. can create the, the, that works the fine. thing on the stack. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we are all set to uh, file our first bug report. Uh, first thing that we do is create the object, uh, then we start the transaction. Every database operation in ODB is performed within a transaction. There is no such thing as, as implicit database transactions. Uh, the next that, line. I'm sorry, should that dot be an arrow? Uh, yeah. The first one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Mistake. Um, yeah, that, that should be a pointer. Just a pointer. Um, so the so we start the transaction every day. Every database operation is performed within the transaction. Then we call the persist function, which returns the uh, object ID for the new persistent object. Uh, finally, we commit the transaction to make the changes permanent. For those interested, here is the uh, SQL insert statement that is executed as a result of the persist call. Um, yes. What happens if the commit fails? Uh, Do then throw an exception, yeah, yeah, retry? Exception, or is, or? exception is thrown and um, there, there are certain uh, ex classes of exceptions which we call recoverable. Like for example, a connection uh, when bad or timeout happened, which we can detect and retry. Mm -hmm. Yes? So the, the commit doesn't happen on the destructor of the transaction? No. Um, if you don't commit the transaction explicitly on destruct, it will be aborted. So you have to commit your changes explicitly. Um, what, what is a non recoverable exception? Um, well, for example, you are trying to persist uh, an object with an, I with an ID uh, that is already exists in the database. You will get a duplicate ID uh, exception, which is well, which is probably not recoverable. Okay, so um, that's, that's a programming error. Would you consider? Yes. Okay. By recoverable, we mean that. Basically, the same, exactly the same operation can be, the same transaction can be tried without no, uh, any action. No argument. Programming errors are not recoverable, um, but but I also strongly object to using exceptions for them. But I can talk to you about that after if you'd like. Okay. Well, I would like to actually hear well, what you propose. One, and I turn it. one so. more small detail. So after construction of the object B. What is in the member ID? Is it some special member that says this is an uninitialized ID because it is implicitly generated by the persistence? Right, form? well, it doesn't really matter. Uh, ah, okay, so we it's mentioned just that it's automatically assigned ID, so every time you persist an object, ODB will make sure that the correct value is stored. So after we call persist, uh, the ID member in B will be initialized. Okay, so if I read read an object and persist it again, then it's duplicate. Because then a new ID will be generated right. with the same content. Right. Okay. Well, if you want to change the, make changes to the state, then there's another function mm -hmm. for that. But yeah, you can only persist an object <coughs> once with the mm -hmm. same ID. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Are IDs reusable at some point? Or? Uh, it's database specific, uh, and some of them allow you to do that. Some of them don't, and, but yeah, you, depending on which database you use, you can 
set it to use or not. Like for example, a skill light allows you to kind of use the same ideas. But is, it, is it a grid kind of thing or is it monotonic increase you want to Yes, do? by default it's monotonic increase. Okay. Which makes um, kind of prevent certain kind of errors by default. Okay. Let's say we want to load um, a bug report corresponding to an ID given its ID. This transaction shows how we can do that. Um, the commented out section shows an alternative version which loads the state of an object directly into an existing instance. This is basically how you would work with uh, persistent objects that don't have <coughs> default constructors, which is a bit less convenient but can be um, important for if you have legacy policies. So if you, if you need to create objects on the stack. Sorry, question. Yes. The, uh, the transaction itself, are, are you going to cover that later in some detail? or? Um, Not really. No. Okay, okay. So <laughs> I'll ask the question now then. Um, so obviously, sometimes you're going to want to read the database, sometimes you're going to want to write the database, you're going to want to control those parameters for concurrency reasons. How do you do that within the transaction itself, or is that during the connection, or where is that? Well, th this is actually also database specific, as I think is uh, expected. Yep. Uh, for example, just to give you an example, um, MySQL as a fairly, um, sorry, SQL light as a fairly, um, what should I say, peculiar concurrency uh, model. Yeah. And it's uh, to, to kind of make it work, uh, make it easier for people to, to use that. Um, they uh, they allow you to to start uh, immediate or exclusive transaction. Right. So while the a common database interface doesn't provide this functionality. If you use the concrete database class, or DB SQLite -like database, there are functions, for example, begin exclusive or begin immediate. So that, that's, uh, so, I think that's... So the DB begin is... Is the default, what? it's default begin transaction statement. Start Which the transaction. read or write or what? Um, Depends on the database, but generally, um, in in most databases, it's it's it starts as read and then upgrades to write. Okay, so basically, uh, I'll just say that 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 seems like a non-starter to me. I mean, you'd want your begin to be at least as portable as you can make it, right? So that you don't have to rewrite your transaction <coughs> code if you switch from one database to another. If you're just going to go with whatever the default the database provides is on um, begin it, you know I, I don't know I, it just I don't know what it means that's that's the other half of it here right so anyway just a comment sorry but I, I don't know do, do you have any specific um, uh, just, well, like <laughs> we have something very similar to this and we provide a static transaction in case you don't want to lock the rows do you have something like that where you don't have to explicitly create a new transaction I, I don't think I, I, I quite follow. Um, see, normally in a database, a transaction is start, it doesn't have, uh, hold any locks. So one, then once you do a read operation, uh, it, it acquires a, a read lock. You know, depending on the implementation, can be on a table, on a row. Um, then if you do a, a write operation, it, it upgrades the lock to, to write. And ODB up and the database, see, ODB cannot magically invent operation that is not supported by the, data, by the underlying database. Correct. So for, for certain, uh, data, certain database, like I mentioned, <coughs> scale light, if, if, for example, you know from the outset you have a lot of read operations and then at the bottom you have a write operation, uh, to reduce contention you can start the transaction in the write mode right away. Correct. But for example, for MySQL, there is no such thing as start transaction as write transaction because, well, depending on the underlying backend, it, it can do row level locking, table level locking. Right. So they, they, have a, a, they, they have a notion of you can lock a, a row and a table or a table. Exactly. Right? But, but it doesn't happen at the start of the transaction. So this, this it, the by default, it gives you the default um, start transaction semantics. And then there are, um, there are 
certain databases provide you certain ways to tune those. But you see, it's, it's very dependent how the underlying database implements locking of things. Does it make sense? <coughs> yeah, let's go on. I, I'm not saying I totally agree with what you're saying, but let's go on. Okay, here's again the skill statement uh, that is executed as a result of this transaction. Uh, another database operation um, that we will probably want to use is updating the, mm -hmm. updating the state of a persistent object in the database. Th this transaction shows how we can change the status of a bug report to confirmed. Again, here's the SQL update statement that is executed as a result of this transaction. Boris? Yes. On the previous slide, you had the, uh, yeah, that one? Yes. Did you really need to commit it if you just loaded it and kind of did, you didn't really change it? Was that, or were you assuming that you changed it between the, the load and the commit? Not necessarily, but ge the general model. In this case, if you abort it or don't do explicit commit, commit then nothing will, there won't be any noticeable differences in your program state, but the general, you see what happens now, you basically say, oh, I don't need to commit this transaction, then you come later and add some update, but you forget to, to commit the thing. So g generally we suggest that you know, there is a clear uh, start of a transaction and then a commit of a transaction or a port. Even if it's just a read? Right. Is the transaction required if it's just a read? Well, if if it's required, it would seem to me to be would be a big advantage to have something in the interface that forces you to have created it uh, at compile time. Uh, I agree. Uh, if you have any suggestions, how to well, do like that. for example, all of the operations like load could take a transaction parameter that you have to pass. For example. Um, or the transaction gives you all the operations. Like yeah, forwards, we'll load on forwards, transaction. forwards things through to the database. That would be, that's the, actually what I would do. Um, the problem with this approach is that uh, theoretically you can use, you can work with multiple databases you know, using distributed transactions. So you can start the transaction on Monday on a transaction monitor, for example. Okay. And then, you know, a, a database joins this transaction, another database joins this transaction. Okay. So, uh, if you have a the load, for example, um, load function on the on the transaction, then yeah, I guess you could pass the da the database as a parameter. You have an optional parameter for the database, or if you have a special kind of transaction that's a multi database transaction, where you have to pass that parameter. That's what I do. I think to me it seems that it's it's natural to to load things from the database rather than from the transaction. So kind of makes uh, you know, the, the reality kind of more closely. But I agree it would be nice to to enforce uh, you know, transaction by boundaries at compile time. Well a way to look at it that would make more sort of natural sense is that the is that you're adding these operations to the transaction and then you commit the transaction and it's done. Except for loads. No. <laughs> Except for loads. The, the other way to look because loads are way to this is, is to just say sure. that you don't need a transaction if, if all you do is reading from the database. But the, the, the thing is, underneath most, well, at least to my knowledge, most databases will start an implicit transaction. Mm -hmm. So it'll actually might perform worse because if you have 20 reads, you will start 20 implicit transactions instead of one. Okay. That's a good reason not to do it. A simple thing would be to have your begin take a transaction. So then you can't not have a transaction and have to begin, you know, kind of initialize the transaction. And then you just it. forget to call begin. Exactly. <laughs> well then, I mean, obviously the rest will just, your your load will just throw, everything will throw. That's what it does. But that's not, yeah. Yeah. It's not No, but the, by, by making begin pass in a T, pass it's in a transaction. As opposed to return one? Yeah, and as opposed to returning one. Then, but then you just forget to call begin. Yeah. It still, it still doesn't check the compile 
Uh, well, have you thought about caching transactions? I mean, so that so that people are just doing a bunch of loads over and over again. You just have this one transaction that's so, open, and then you. Well, that's what I was saying earlier. Really this, you have a static one that's a default that the load doesn't have to take a transaction. If you don't pass one in, it just uses the static. Static transaction. It's just always running. I think you will run into. You see, once a transaction reads something, it acquires a local on, on something in the database. So if you have a static transaction, every time you read something, it kind of accumulates logs. Which will but no, the, kind of I mean, the, the static transaction doesn't actually have a call to the end of commit. Right. It's actually a it's pseudo transaction. It doesn't actually do a transaction. But then we have, we, we have the same problem that, you know, the performance. implicit transaction will be created right. Right. every time. Right. Right. Every time for every read. Which yeah, is, so you can add an optimization by creating a real transaction. Right, exactly. Right. So for and convenience, you can leave it out. If you find it's a performance problem, you can add it back in. I guess it's not the option. Yes. How does Stephen Evolution work? Well, I mean, just to answer your question in one sentence, it doesn't at the moment, but there are plans for it. I was just trying to ask about something that you had said you were going to get to. Ready to move on, yeah. Okay. Let's see how we can uh, query the database to find all the open um, open bug reports. Um, the first two lines <coughs> in this uh, code fragment define the query and result types for uh, for the bug persistent class. The actual uh, query happens on the in the highlighted line. Um, the query type defines members. Uh, such as status corresponding to the data members in the persistent class. We can use these members to create uh, query predicates. The result of a, of a transaction is a container-like result object which supports input iteration. So this is just a, just input iteration, not even, not even forward or bidirectional. Just no. I, I, I don't okay. want to, exp to go into that, but I can explain to you why. Well, I just I just wanted to be I just wanted to only input iteration. Wanted to be be clear that when you said that I understood exactly what yes. you meant. You cannot uh, reiterate the result for reasons that I don't want to go into. That's not. Here's the select the skill select statement for this um, query. Mm -hmm. right, let's now look at some more interesting um, examples of uh, queries. Mm -hmm. The first two lines show that we can use uh, C++ logical operators uh, to combine predicates. So the idea here is that we create a, a language embedded um, query language that mimics uh, select, skills to select queries. Uh, the next block shows how we can use by reference parameter binding instead of by value. Uh, by default, all, all parameters are bound by value. Uh, the last line, oh, the next line shows um, native support for native queries. Uh, native queries is essentially uh, a where clause of the SQL select statement uh, plus support for parameter bindings. The last line shows the advantages of e language integrated queries uh, compared to the native ones. Uh, in, in native queries, we use uh, strings to identify columns and um, parameters that we pass are typed. So it's, it's quite easy to misspell things or compare incompatible values, and such things will only be detected uh, at runtime instead of at compile time. Yes? Can you create like a, a, a predicate object that will give you a rich range of or a set of queries and capability um, instead of just saying you know, didn't quite get it. Uh, you you want uh, pre pre uh, I think I know what he's talking about. Like like if you wanted to have your where clause be based on another query. Yes. Or something like a more like a nested thing like that. Yeah. Well, the like first set, yeah. the first um, two lines show we how we can do that instead of those uh, comparison to comparison 
expressions, we could have actually more complex uh, query objects in there. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And all, I'm not showing here, but there are lots of, I mean, all the standard uh, comparison operators are important. <laughs> and there's some things like in range you know, that do to model a scale select uh, in range operators. <coughs> So like that last one, <clears throat> if I just wanted to write it as a straight up string, stats equals one, two, three, without yes. the query stuff, I could do that too? Yes, that, that's exactly why we support um, native queries. You know, if you, for some reason, you post the integrated language doesn't allow you something to do something database specific, for example, and you can always fall back. <coughs> So, so the under the hood, you're converting that into a string. What about the what about the enum? Are you converting that into a string? Or? Um, well, that, that depends on the database. It depends how the enumerations are represented in the database. But generally, it will do the right thing, but not might not always. Do that. <coughs> yeah. Any other questions? So query status is generated. And the open and confirmed or not. So is query status, this is some function object that infects that whole expression and it becomes a big function object? You mean here? No, the next one up. No, sorry. No. The first The first one, yeah. Um, it's not really a function object. It's basically um, underneath it maps everything to standard. SQL. Okay. So when 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 you uh, combine two queries with a, a C plus plus operator, you know, it basically um, takes two uh, sub clauses in, in SQL and must be poor things like that. But yes, there's so definitely magic objects there that are, mm -hmm. that are overloading all the operators and combining them into some magic. Mm -hmm. Obviously, yeah. Mm -hmm. Basically, that's an embedded DSL that gets transformed into SQL. Right. Pretty much. Cool. <laughs> Sweet. A very common common theme here at Boostar. Right? Mm -hmm. so, Except <laughs> that this doesn't take half an hour to compile. <laughs> <laughs> well, what good is it then? So, does that answer my question whether it uses Proto or not? <laughs> yeah. It does. Um, okay, the last. Uh, uh, operation that we haven't talked about is deleting the state of a persistent object. Nothing really uh, interesting here. And the uh, scale statement is also quite trivial. You can also, instead of an ID, you can just pass the object uh, itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so this is good. Um, yes. Could you pass a query there? Um, no. Bug ID you cannot. Status equals whatever. No, but what you can do, you can run a query and then iterate over it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is pretty much the high level overview of, of, of ODB. Um, now I'd like to talk a bit more about more advanced uh, techniques and also how we can use it together with boost. Um, in our bug report, we use simple, uh, simple types like for data members such as integer or string. How does ODB know how to store those uh, types in the database? Well, ODB only knows how to do that for a handful of types. Basically, of, of all the fundamental C++ types plus std string. Uh, ODB also allows us to uh, write, to provide our custom persistence routines for our own types. So on one end, we can ODB has built-in support for basic types, and it also allows us to provide custom uh, persistence for our own types. But there is a third class of types that kind of doesn't fit into these two categories very well. These are types from uh, uh, commonly used frameworks and libraries such as Boost and Qt. To, to, um, to solve this problem, ODB has the notion of profiles. Uh, a profile is a generic mechanism for integrating ODB with third-party uh, frameworks and libraries. Um, a profile is essentially a glue code that allows us to persist 
um, containers, uh, smart pointers, value types found in these frameworks and libraries as if they were supported natively by the ODB compiler. Uh, currently, ODB includes uh, Boost and NQT profiles, but it's, it's, a, it's a generic mechanism, so it's fairly easy to write a profile for your own library. Um, to enable it, a particular profile, we use the dash p uh, option for the ODB compiler. Yes. Do you do you use or could you use Fusion for some of that to describe the data structures and stuff? You know, like just Fusion uh, structure mapping and stuff like that. Use that adapt struct. Adapt struct and all that kind of stuff. So it's, uh, uh, I'm not um, really familiar with <coughs> Fusion that that um, to that extent, but. Generally, providing your own um, persistence for value types is fairly easy, and, and it all, it's also uh, usually database specific, especially for more complex types. Also, when you've got a compiler like this, you often don't really need to resort to uh, right. macros and metaprogramming tricks because you have a giant metaprogram that's running everything. Right. Okay, um, the current version of the boost profile um, uh, includes support for shared and new pointers plus the lazy versions. Uh, I'll talk about lazy pointers uh, later. Then there's support for the unordered containers library and for the date time library. Uh, uh, I was just going to say it's a winner because it supports date time. So. <laughs> <laughs> nice job. You take back all that other bits? Yeah, I take back time. everything else I said. <laughs> um, <laughs> as an example, let's uh, add uh, creation and modification timestamps to our bug report uh, using the boost date time library. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's pretty much all we have to do. <coughs> Up until now, we used simple values for me data members in our persistent classes, such as int or a string or date time. Um, but at some point, you would want to use something more complex, such as a container. ODB provides built in support for uh, most standard C containers, such as vector, list, and map, set, and map. Um, profiles provide support for additional containers for in, in, in case of the boost profile they, they support for the unordered containers library. It's also easy to add support for your own containers. As an example, let's add um, a list of comments and a set of tags to our bug report. As, as you can see, we don't really need to do anything beyond what we will do if we want writing a normal, ordinary C++ class, it just works. Uh, another kind of, of more complex uh, value types that we would often want to use in our persistent classes are multi-column or composite value types. Um, these types must be explicitly marked with a, uh, a value pragma similar to our, our persistent objects that <coughs> we marked with an object pragma. Uh, composite values can contain uh, simple values, other composite values, containers, and, and pointers to objects. And I will talk about pointers to objects in a second. As an example, let's extend our uh, comments in our bug report with a creation timestamp. So the changes that we have to make are, are highlighted. Okay, um, so we, we've, we've seen how to use simple values, composite values, and containers as data members in, in our persistent classes. The last thing that we, uh, the last kind of type that we can use as data members are pointers to objects. Uh, pointers to objects represent relationships. ODB includes support for raw pointers, um, a standard auto pointer, and shared and weak pointers from the TR. Similar to containers, profiles provide support for additional pointers. It's also easy to add support for a custom pointer. One uh, glaring omission in our bug tracker so far is the lack of the bug report information. So to fix this, let's add a, a, a user persistent class. Very simple stuff. <coughs> 
and add a pointer to to it in our bar in a bar point. Here we use the boost shear pointer. This is an example of a unidirectional to one relationship. Uh, that is, uh, each bug is reported by a single, by a single user. The other useful feature would be to have a list of uh, bugs reported by each user. Uh, a, a vector of pointers will do the trick here. This is an example of a bidirectional many-to-one relationship. A bug is reported by a single user, but a user can report multiple bugs. The reference cycle doesn't bother you? Um, it, it, it does, but yeah, I'll get to that in a second. Um, what about this inverse pr uh, pragma? And, uh, actually, it should be finished by now. You get the. Yeah, you get the. No, you get the. 45 minutes. 45 minutes. Yeah. I'm going to skip this because yeah. I need to finish yeah, the whole thing, right? Um, no, it's, it's oh, a it's like a half one. Oh, it's a half one. Oh, so oh. oh okay. Just five more minutes. Um, so I, I skip the chunk. So back to Dave's uh, question. Um, yeah, you basically identified the problem even before uh, you know, I got to it. Um, we, we basically have a, an ownership cycle between the user and the bug class which is easy to solve with a big point, right? But there's actually another problem here, um, which is a bit more complex. Um, imagine we, have a, uh, we want to load a bug report and print some basic information about it, such as um, you know, description and, and, and who reported it. Imagine also that uh, this, bug, this particular bug was reported by a very active user of our software who filed like hundreds of bug reports in our database. Let's see what happens here. Um, when we load the bug uh, object, it contains a pointer to the bug to the report. So we have to load the user object as well. And then the user object in turn contains a list of uh, bugs reported by this user. So this, those have to be loaded as well. In the end, an innocent looking transaction can pull hundreds of objects from the database. Objects that we don't even need. Uh, this is obviously not good. A solution to this problem um, are lazy pointers. Uh, lazy pointers provide finer grade uh, control over, over the relationship load. Um, every supported pointer by, by either ODB compiler itself or by the profile has a corresponding lazy version. Here's an example how we can fix this um, using the uh, lazy version for the boost weak pointer. Besides the standard uh, boost interface, this pointer has a couple of extra functions such as load, which allow us to uh, load the pointer to object if and when it's necessary. Why would that be separate from the lock function? Um, <coughs> you just hide the lock function with something that also loads. Because you might, you might want to check whether well, whether it's you might want to check is it is it there? If it's there, use it. If it's not there, then don't load it. Something like that. Okay. Well, generally we, we wanted to kind of keep the boost interface behave exactly like the, the, the normal version. Okay, let me just run through quickly uh, database schemas. Um, we can, as I mentioned, we can ask the ODB compiler to generate the schema for us. A well, database schema is essentially a set of SQL uh, create statements that create the, the tables necessary to store our classes. So we can uh, ask, either ask the ODB compiler to generate them for us. Um, this approach is, is commonly referred to as object first. Or we can, alternatively, we can mm, do what is called database first, where the schema already exists for or created first, and in this case we map our classes to the existing scheme. So in case in case of the standalone, um, uh, in case of the generated schema, the RDB compiler can produce it in two forms. It can either be a standalone SQL file, which is normally the preferred method for client-server databases such as MySQL. Alternatively, we can embed uh, embed the uh, database schema directly into the generated code. And then 
created programmatically from within our application as shown in this example. This is normally the preferred approach for embedded data research, such as SQL Lite, if you don't want to drag an SQL file around. Um, if we want to use custom schema, ODB allows you to map classes to tables, members to columns, and C++ types to database types. Just to give you a quick example, here's a legacy bug database schema. As you can see here, we use some weird names and, and the types are a bit different as well. Um, here's a mapping of our bug class to, to, to that schema. Um, is it, it looks, looks quite busy. They're actually more of the Pragma code than C++ code. Um, well, the advantage is to keeping things together. Uh, some of you might prefer to separate you know, C++ from ODB stuff. Um, in fact, you can pl place the Pragmas pretty much anywhere in the, in the header file, or even factor them out into a separate file. Now, if you don't want any traces of ODB in your header file, for whatever reasons, maybe you're working with legacy here that cannot be modified, then you can uh, include the mapping file using an ODB compiler option, instead of an include directive. So there's quite a bit of, of flexibility when it comes to where you can place the pragmas. Okay. Let me um, wrap up then quickly. Um, compared to other mainstream programming languages, uh, the C++ community, in my opinion, is sorely lacking uh, a mature and complete ORM implementation. Uh, one of the users of ODB told me that he examined a lot of ORM implementations for C++, um, but he said most of them look like some of weekend project. So, as you can see, we have, we have a lot of catching up to do. Uh, my goal with ODB is to have a, have a complete uh, open source, cross-platform and cross-database uh, ORM implementation for C++. Um, here, let me just jump directly to schema evolution because that seems to be the most interesting um, uh, question. Uh, it's not, not supported at the moment, but that's something that we are working on. And, but it's also a very hard problem, especially if you want to, when you, when you add a delete member, that, that's fairly easy to solve. But when you, you know, change a type of an existing member, that's a much more difficult problem. So we'll probably start with something easy, like adding members or deleting members and see how it goes. Uh, other things that uh, we are planning to do is add support for more libraries from Boost. Uh, optional sounds like a really a good idea, and pr probably the clean mapping to the database will be the null semantic there. Um, well, obviously, then support for more databases. Um, yeah, I don't know talk about anything else. Uh, some resources, if you want to give it a try, there's a lot of examples, uh, extensive documentation. Uh, ODB homepage pretty much has all the links down below or you can jump to the manual. Uh, one of the first six, uh, chapters in the manual is a Hello World example, which uh, discusses every step in excruciating details. <laughs> there are mailing lists. You are welcome to post some um, questions or import problems there. Yeah, there's my blog. I sometimes post there about ODB and C++ in general. Um, thank you very much. Uh, that's it from me, and sorry, I ran. Over time.